Hi everyone, welcome to the UVM Extension New Farmer Project webinar, Enhancing Native Pollinator Populations on Farms. I'm Jesse Schmidt and I work for the UVM Extension New Farmer Project. I'm going to be moderating this session. Our presenter today is John Hayden. He's the owner um, or co-owner of the Farm Between in Jeffersonville, Vermont. Uh, John has a master's degree in agricultural entomology and over 30 years of professional experience in sustainable agriculture as a university educator, researcher, extension agent international consultant and a practicing organic farmer. We're psyched to have you. Welcome, John. Thanks, Jesse. It's great to be here. This is very interesting to me to be doing a webinar. It's kind of outside of my boundaries, but uh, I'm excited to have some fun with it. Okay, so in the slide advance. So this is uh, the title of our talk today is going to be Enhancing Pollinator Populations on Farms. This is a picture of an aerial photo of our farm that was taken about 10 years ago. And you can see we're a small scale and a very diversified farm. We've, uh, in the past 10 years, we've added lots more pollinator habitat since then. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting another aerial one of these days. And what we're going to talk about is how you can build up populations on your own farm. So for today's webinar, we're going to do some introductions. And I'm going to talk about uh, our farm background and why the pollinators are so important to us, why they are important to everyone, who the pollinators are, um, why they are in trouble, and probably the most important thing, what can we do as farmers or gardeners or homeowners to enhance the, our local populations. I mean, uh, hopefully we'll have some time at the end for some questions and answers and maybe some online discussion. So I had a few uh, questions to ask. And um, there's a checkbox above the main, uh, I guess it's above the main room area there where you can check yes or no for these questions. So I'm kind of curious to find out who's uh, on board today. And my first question is, are you a farmer? Okay, so we got a majority of farmers there. My second question is, do you keep honeybees? Okay, no beekeepers. And then my third question is, um, up to date, have you done anything to manage the, for alternative pollinators on your farm or property. So for folks unfamiliar with the, the checkbox function, uh, Tina just um, asked, you'll see there's a, um, in the list of participants in the participant window underneath your name, there's a, a checkbox um, uh, that, uh, you can click on to indicate, you know, yes or no, or feel free to just type in the chat box your answers to these questions. Um, that's just fine too. And it looks like Tina just got honeybees. I'm jealous. <laughs> okay, so good. We do have a beekeeper. Nice. And then we have, uh, so we have five people who have already been doing something to manage alternative pollinators, and two that haven't yet. So great. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our farm. This is the, the farm between. We've been here uh, 22 years. And we're a small, diversified organic farm. We've uh, raised livestock, veggies, and fruit over those 22 years. But now we're focused mainly on fruit. And uh, we're, uh, like I said, we're small scale. And our philosophy is small is beautiful. So scale drives a lot of our decision making. Um, we are raising high value crops because that allows us to stay small and also have a sustainable livelihood. So we, we grow, right now we're growing um, over 30 different kinds of fruit. And um, they range from the common, like uh, apples or strawberries. And here's a nice picture of Nancy with her strawberry harvest. She's our head picker. Cherries here. This one up in the top center is uh, Hascap which is uh, a, a species of uh, honeysuckle, non-invasive blue honeysuckle from uh, Siberia and northern Japan. 
And here's me picking some the lower right. Here's me picking some red currants. And we have some rhubarb. And we are uh, certified organic through Vermont Organic Farmers. So that's our production. Our marketing, uh, we, we raise quite a bit of, uh, raise and sell quite a bit of fresh fruit, probably about, um, I'd say, 30% uh, or so gets sold as wholesale and at the Burlington Farmers Market. Um, we, you can see these uh, fruit syrups. Let's see, let me get my circle thing here. We raise, uh, we raise the fruit and then we add value to them by making these fruit syrups. So these are, um, we have black currant, elderberry ginger, strawberry rhubarb. We have a whole slew of different flavors that we make. And then we can add value to those fruit syrups by making snow cones. And we make uh, fruit fountain sodas like this. Um, so it's a healthy alternative to uh, the, the, the crappy snow cones and sodas that you can get through conventional methods. We also have a fruit nursery. We're uh, propagating our own uh, fruit plants and also more edible landscape and pollinator friendly plants. And you can say hello to my two draft horses here. <laughs> There's one of them. Not so good at the circle. Um, we also have uh, 14 acres out back that was prior used for hayland that we are in the process now and over the past years converting into a pollinator sanctuary. So we've been letting the asters and the goldenrod, the milkweed, this beautiful joe pie weed in the front um, come in naturally. And we're also planting trees like black locust, basswood, and pollinator friendly shrubs back there, um, all interspersed with more fruit plantings. We save the really good ground for our fruit and then the more uh, challenging or wetter land we're, we're planting with the um, pollinator friendly plants. So I think our long term goal to see this area as a an educational area where people would come as a destination and be able to interact with pollinators. And uh, we're thinking of some kind of pollinator pathway winding through there um, for people to enjoy and learn more about pollinators. So pollinators are important to us. I think you figured out we grow fruit. So everything starts as a flower and uh, becomes a fruit. And we need the help of our pollinator allies to get there. Um, for, the, for everyone else, uh, pollinators are important not only because they're beautiful and interesting, but because 30% uh, of our crops require pollinators. So if you look at this uh, Whole Foods display at the top, is a typical produce display. And then they went through at the bottom and pulled out your produce choices without bees. So basically, uh, you see a lot of seedless oranges there. And I don't know what those red things are, potatoes. But there's not a lot of uh, choices left. As farmers, <laughs> we see the results of poor pollination. And sometimes we don't even recognize it. You know, on these raspberries up top, you can see they're not being fully formed. Um, cucumber, the seeds are not formed there, so it doesn't grow out straight. And the same thing with the apples. So who are these pollinators that uh, we rely on for so much? Um, most of them are, and the most important ones, are the insects. We also, uh, a lot of plants have adapted and evolved for different pollinators. So some of them are wind pollinated. These are generally the smaller flowers that are not showing, um, don't, don't uh, try to attract pollinators. Birds and bats are also pollinators. We're not going to really talk about them other than this cool picture of the bat. And the fact that I've been seeing quite a bit of uh, hummingbirds in our blueberries recently. So I think they're actually doing some work for us. Maybe even eating some of the spotted wing drosophila. I just learned that this year that hummingbirds eat insects. So, but the stars of the show really are the insect pollinators. And there's uh, different orders of insects or that uh, do do some pollinating, such as um, beetles, the flies, butterflies, and moths, and uh, wasps also. So don't get down on wasps so much. They do have some good attributes. And but again, the stars of the insect world are going to be the bees. This is a this is a picture of a clear wing uh, hummingbird moth. It's kind of a um, hummingbird bumblebee mimic. 
So, uh, like I said, these are the mainstay and the, the insects that I'm really most interested in working with. They're very they're closely related to wasps. They're in the same order, the Hymenoptera. And but the main difference between bees and wasps is um, bees are vegans, so they're only interested in pollen and nectar, and uh, they're also fuzzy, so they got that going for them too. They've got a lot of hairs, and that makes them great pollinators. Wasps are um, predatory, so they they eat meat or provision their nests with meat for their young to grow on. And uh, when we talk about bees. Well, we put them in different uh, categories based on their ecological niche. So they can be solitary nesting bees, where it's just one female uh, making her own um, nest and provisioning it, to or um, social, like uh, like the bumblebees and honeybees that we know so much about. They can be ground nesting or cavity nesting, so holes in the ground or holes in trees or uh, different little uh, nooks and crannies they can find. Uh, in terms of what they eat, bees can be uh, generalists where they're going for multiple flowers or they can be tied in with uh, one specific flower. You know, there's a sunflower bee, um, there's squash bees, and, and they just work those plants and they've timed their life cycle around them. Uh, and bees, like I said, are the most important pollinators that we have. So uh, just some cool pictures here of bee lookalikes. This comes out of the Encyclopedia of Life that Harvard University put together. And uh, actually, none of these are bees. This one actually right here, this number two, is my favorite. That's a, a robber fly that even though it's eating a bee, I still like them because they're so cool. They catch things on the, on the wing and uh, insert their stylet kind of proboscis and suck them dry. So very interesting. Predator. Uh, bees are great pollinators because they're all about the pollen. That's what they provision their nests with for their young. And um, they have evolved all these really cool transport mechanisms. Like in number one, that is on the legs of that bumblebee. That's uh, called the corbicula. And it's, uh, they, that's like bee bread right there. It's a little mix of nectar and pollen to make it stick. If you look in number two, that's a, uh, a megachylid bee, but they, they've got what's called a scopa on their abdomen. So that's uh, some stiff, bristly hairs. And it acts like a powder puff for collecting and dispersing pollen. That's a great identifying uh, piece for one of those if you see them out in the field. Number three is uh, Melisodes, and they have a scopa on their legs. So those bristly hairs are all the way up in the leg. They look like those old-fashioned fuzzy uh, leg warmers that um, people used to wear in the 70s and 80s. <laughs> and then even some bees, like this one in number four, um, they store a pollen in their crop and they then regurgitate it. So kind of like uh, how a bird would feed their babies. So there are tons of different kinds of bees. <laughs> when you say bee, people often just think about honeybees. But in Vermont, there's around 300 different species and uh, 4,000 in North America. This is a, if you get a chance and you're interested in looking at insects up close, this Digital Museum of Natural History, this Alex Garcia uh, has a Facebook page and you can order posters of this stuff, which of course I have a bee poster. Okay, well, I'm going to talk about some of the different families of bees and then the representatives that are uh, the ones we're also going to come across here in the Northeast. Um, the family Apidae, which includes the honeybees and bumblebees, also has the squash bee. This is uh, Peponapus pruinosa. And uh, these are very important specialists for uh, cucurbits. When uh, honeybees are sleeping in right before dawn, you'll see these bees flying. And they are awesome and very important pollinators of pumpkins and squashes. So um, they're getting most of the work done. And when the bees, when honeybees wake up, a lot of the nectar and pollen they already have been scooped up. And these guys are ground nesters, so it's something to think about when you're um, cultivating your pumpkins that maybe you don't have to cultivate every little square inch uh, to, you know, to save, save some nesting space for these helpers. OK, the megachylids, these are the mason bees and leaf cutters. And like I said before, I showed you that one with the powder puff. They've got the abdominal scopa here for carrying the pollen. But these uh, 
Leaf uh, cutters are also very interesting. Sometimes you'll see these uh, big holes in leaves, roses and uh, other plants, and you wonder what they're from. They're from these bees. Uh, they, they cut them up and they use them to line their nests. Um, another megachylid that's very important uh, here in the northeast for pollinating a lot of our early fruit uh, trees like apples and uh, pear, pears and cherries and plums is the, um, the blue orchard mason bee. And these guys, uh, these gals I should say, because it's the females that are gathering all the pollen. The males are there to mate and drink nectar, so they're really uh, <laughs> not as respected as the females, okay? These are thought to be 75 times more efficient than honeybees in pollinating, just in their flight patterns, and they're not going back to the uh, hive or their nest as often. They don't fly linear like a honeybee would go down the row, so these, these ones are going buzzing all over the place randomly. Even though they're sticking to the same type of flower, they're really good for cross-pollinating because they're, they're like that. And the main thing about these uh, blue orchard mason bee that makes them so desirable for a fruit farm is that they fly in inclement weather. Honeybees, they like to fly when it's 55 degrees and sunny or, you know, no rain. But these uh, blue orchard mason bees, they can fly when it's... Um, when it's even cooler than that and drizzling and so they're they're uh, definitely great for early season crops. Um, we also have the andrenids and these are the minor bees. They're the ones where you'll see the holes in your lawn or in your sandy driveway or sometimes in the schoolyard and people are panicking but uh, I should say these solitary bees, they haven't evolved the same kind of defensive mechanisms as uh, um, social bees like honeybees and bumblebees, so they rarely sting. Um, they don't, they don't um, they put a lot of uh, effort into protecting their nest that way. And these are, um, these andrenids, there's quite a few different species of these. Like I said, they're ground nesters, but they're uh, a very early season bee. You'll usually um, see these in May these holes in the ground. They look like ant hills, but uh, with the holes that would be way too big for ants. And they're especially important in our early season crops. We see tons of these in our apples. And then uh, another uh, gem of a bee are the sweat bees. They're called sweat bees because they tend to be um, attracted to salt and, and our perspiration, and sometimes they'll land on you. And, um, sometimes you feel a little prick. I think they're just biting on the skin. That's not really a sting. They're just trying to get as much salt as they can. This, uh, this one here on my hand on the right is the agopostemnon. That's the male. He's got the striped abdomen and uh, the females have the, the green abdomen. And they're, these are also ground nesters. And uh, they're not that, people don't notice them, but they're, you know, out there getting it done, getting the pollination done. Okay, so we hear a lot in the news and social media lately about pollinators in decline. So, you know, what's all the buzz about? And, um, you know, sometimes you'll see this quote attributed to um, Einstein, if the bee disappeared from the surface of the globe, then man will only have four years of life left. There's uh, all kinds of um, um, campaigns going on with uh, the neonicotinoid insecticides like this one about Lowe's uh, having their nursery plants that they're selling that are, have the systemic insecticides in them that are going all through the plant so that are even coming out in the pollen and uh, nectar and leaf exudates. So, you know, we're hearing about that. The uh, monarch butterfly populations are declining. We can see here in 2013. You know, the size of the butterfly here is the relative size of the population cell or the um, nesting area in Mexico. So, um, not nesting, sorry, the overwintering uh, hibernation area in Mexico. And they're down to 1.65 acres. This is the whole eastern population of monarchs that go to this one area to overwinter. So, there's definitely some problems going on. But, on the other hand, um, you know, this Albert Einstein never said half the stuff people said. And the, the moral of the story here is get the quote from the source, which is the bees. If we die, we're taking you with us. I'm trying to be a little lighthearted here, but uh, it is a serious problem. 
Um, in China, where the, it's gotten so bad from pesticide use and loss of habitat in some areas, they've had to resort to hand uh, pollinating. And hopefully we're not going to get to that situation here. Um, so the one that's been studied the most, I think, and hear, people hear the most about are the honeybees, because they're such an important uh, part of our agricultural economy. And you'll hear about the colony collapse disorder, which is a, you know, it's a real thing, and it's very, but it's a very specific thing. It's where the bees actually leave, leave the hives for, for no uh, known reason. And uh, scientists think and entomologists think that it is uh, attributed to multiple factors that are causing stress. Um, my own theory or my own bias is that I think the uh, pesticide loads that are getting built up in the wax and things are causing some sublethal effects to these bees. If you look at a bee hive like a superorganism and think of uh, that as their immune system being compromised, then uh, when all these other things come in, the varroa mites and the nosema, which is an intestinal parasite, or the new viruses, um, that they're just having a hard time dealing with it. So the colony collapse disorder and this, all these general stressors, um, a lot of our bees are transported around the country to follow crops for pollination. You know, almonds are famous for that. And even this year, even with almond growers following EPA fungicide labels, um, there was some kind of an issue. And 25% um, of the hives that were put out there, which ended up being 425,000 colonies, were killed or severely damaged. So there's a real crisis going on with these bees. And I think uh, you know, there's going to be a shortage of um, mobile hives because of that. These, these uh, migrant beekeepers just lost 25% of their hives. The, uh, like I said, the monarch is uh, in the news a lot. It's just kind of like this iconic insect that um, school children are really involved with. It's so flashy and showy and beautiful. And I'm sure many of you raised a caterpillar on some milkweed and watched it turn into that beautiful chrysalis and then emerge. And it's pretty much a miracle. And um, so this, these numbers don't lie as we look at um, you know, this, our, our year here. Um, it's, it's the smallest it's ever been. So it's, it's, like I said, it's an iconic insect. And I think it's really important that we pay attention to this insect. It would be terrible to lose it. And it's also drawing attention to the plight of all of our other pollinators, which I think is really important. So uh, next on the list in terms of uh, amount of study and uh, resources that are being put into following them are the bumblebees. And what pretty much what we're finding out is some bumblebee species are fine, like the, the common eastern bumblebee, bombs and patients, their um, populations are not in decline at all. But if you look at the um, this Bombus aphimus, a rusty patched bumblebee, bumblebee, for example, they uh, used to be fairly common in Vermont, but they've, uh, they are definitely in decline. And their range has shrunk by about uh, 87%. And so what about the lesser known pollinators? You know, here's a, this is the size range you can see in the, in the bees here. And the, uh, the large one is a um, carpenter bee, and the small one is perdita, which is a little ground nesting pollinator. You know, no one really knows what's going on with the rest of them. We can surmise that they're probably having the same, if not worse, issues as the, the pollinators that are being studied. So you know, why are they in trouble? If you look at uh, this is kind of an old school um, ecology way of looking at things. Um, the population limiting factors. So uh, if you look at this barrel right here, OK, and think of the barrel as the carrying capacity. So the brown barrel represents you know, what an ecosystem could carry in terms of the population. The water in it would be the population size, and then um, the staves are the limiting factors. So you know, one of these staves could be food, like nectar and pollen. Another one could be nesting sites, uh, overwintering sites, disease, predation, pesticides, um, water, you know, amount of water available. All these things could limit the factors. So whatever the minimal one is, that's going to what's going to stop the population from from growing. So this is what we need to think of as farmers when we're trying to enhance our populations. Now, some of the things that are definitely limiting the populations are 
pesticides. And we got, you know, we got the Roundup, which itself isn't directly toxic to uh, the insects, not not uh, acutely toxic, where you can see them die from being sprayed by it. We don't know what the sub lethal effects of them bringing it back to their hives or feeding their young, what it is. But uh, one of the results of all of our acreage of uh, GMO crops is the use of this Roundup. It is a really good weed killer. And uh, where the soybean field down in the bottom here used to uh, have weeds, and uh, but now it's pretty much a biological desert. So that's a lot of habitat that's gone away when there's no weeds, flowering weeds sprouting in those fields anymore. And then uh, on the bottom, right, these are the neonicotinoids that are banned recently this year in the European Union. But here in the US, our homeowners are uh, still have direct use to them. And we know how good homeowners are at following the label. It'll tell you on the label not to spray when the uh, plants are in flower. But you know, people are putting this on their lawns for grubs. And the, the white clover might be in bloom when that's happening. Or um, you know, here's a picture from an extension pamphlet out of Oregon of a woman spraying. And uh, you, know, you can see there's a lot of stuff in bloom. So pesticides are a real issue. You know, the habitat loss. With the, uh, we're really seeing this a lot with the monarchs and the milkweed and hearing a lot about it. But with the ethanol mandate, um, since 2008, 23.6 million acres of marginal land has been planted to uh, corn. And uh, this was formally set aside for conservation. So it, it was you know, wetlands or field edges. And it was great pollinator habitat that, that we've lost. Um, disease is another uh, factor that's ca causing a lot of trouble to our pollinators. Um, and this, here's an example of how the disease um, became a problem with, uh, with the bumblebees. So this is a um, beehive. You can, you can purchase bumblebee hives from companies like Copper. And um, there's a couple other ones. Uh, and you, know, you put them in enclosed spaces, like these, this tomato hoop house. But what happened was um, when they were first developing this technology of rearing these bumblebees, they brought bombs and patients, this, the eastern bumblebee, over to Europe and figured it out there. And then they brought them back. And when they brought them back, they had some new kinds of uh, diseases, and nosema and intestinal parasite and some viruses. So these, uh, when you put these uh, nests out into your fields, some people are putting them out in open fields or in your greenhouses, there's going to be some uh, contamination from that. OK, so I'm going to talk, next up, I'm going to talk about what can we do. Um, are there any questions so far? So if you have a question, feel free to type it in the chat box. Um, and John, we haven't gotten any yet, so feel free to go ahead and move on, and I'll, uh, we'll catch them as we go. OK, and uh, everything's going OK? Sounds fine, and everybody's happy? I'm not seeing any smiley faces. Let me try one of those things. I think it's going great. OK. <laughs> Put your smiley face. Oh, there we go. There's some smiley faces. OK, so, um, so what, what can we do? What can we do? One thing is uh, become a farmer citizen scientist. So you're hearing this term a lot, citizen scientist. And uh, a lot of nonprofits and universities are you know, tapping into citizen, regular citizens who are out there on the ground making observations and taking pictures. And I think it's a great idea. And uh, so here's me and my uh, farmer citizen scientist get up. And uh, you know, I'm having a lot of fun. I got my insect nets. I got my little pouch there that's got uh, all kinds of vials and you know, um, magnifying glasses and stuff in it. And as you know, they say farmers' footprints are the best fertilizer. Well, I think this is true for in terms of getting out and setting aside time to make observations on your farm. So. Um, you, know, you can do your own habitat analysis and make general observations on what's going on. And uh, you know, if you look around behind me on my farm, you can see I got an infinite amount of work to do. And I'm not, I know I'm not going to get it all done. And that's one of my advice to some of you who may be beginning farmers is you're not going to get it all done, so you, but you do need to take time to enjoy it. And, uh, you know, and observations are a really fun way to learn more about your farm, which can improve your bottom line also. So here's an example of uh, some observations I made last year. Um, so the first in this column over here, 
Let's see, I'm going to use a new tool here. This column. Oh, it's still in the circles. Let's see. Oh, there's my pet. So, okay, this column here, you can see are the flowering plant species that we have on our farm. And there's over 100 of them. So I've been uh, paying attention to them and uh, noting the flowering period, which is across here. And um, then I've been graphing it up and for getting, trying to get insight on what's going on. And what I'm ma mainly looking for is uh, some gaps. If there's gaps on the farm in my uh, nectar and pollen flow for the year because you know, we, wanna, we don't want these insects just to have apples. They need something to keep them going year round for the ones that are having multiple generations or are out during that time. And, um, and then when graphing up, so, so some insights I'm looking for. Um, I'm going to show you a spot on this chart here that would illustrate what I'm looking at. So let's say right in here, if you look at the red bars are the crops that we sell, and then the yellow bars are just other flowers. I'm not going to call them weeds because we appreciate them. So there's just other, other flowers on the farm. But you can see right in this period where that circle is, um, We've got a lot of things uh, going on. And um, so what we don't need is the dandelion then. So this is a time where we might mow in between the rows of our, plant, our plants to um, make sure there's not competition. So that, that's the kind of insight we're looking, looking for here. And also maybe thinking about when we're looking for a crop mix, maybe you know we don't need to be planting anything else that's pollinating right at that time, looking for something that's pollinating uh, a little later. So you can do these observations too. You know, even if you take, uh, you know, 15 minutes three times a week just to walk around and make some notes, you can come up with that. Hey, John. This is um, a just a question came up specifically on that slide, which is, what does the A M and B I stand for? Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, that's my. That's just a little note to myself. The uh, Apis mellifera. That's when the first honeybees were seen on the uh, pussy willow and silver maple, and then the B I is the bombus impatiens. So that's when I saw the first queens out. Then, but yeah, somebody's paying attention. That's great. And uh, here's what a uh, scientist scientist does with flowering time. So I went to uh, a talk with Nancy this winter at Sterling College by Gary Navon. He's a scientist and farmer and writer out of Arizona, and he showed this slide. So I was really excited to see he was doing something similar and a little more in depth, where he actually was looking at the quantity of the flowers which is uh, something I might try to add next year, this year. So uh, and right along these lines of citizen scientists, as a farmer, you can apply for um, SARE, re, uh, Farmer Research Grants, which uh, I've been a big fan of over the years. And uh, this is the fourth one I've, I've participated in. And this one is about cover crops and pollinator research. So traditional uses of cover crops are, you know, um, adding organic matter, suppressing weeds, reducing erosion, and feeding pollinators. So we wanted to compare uh, the Spicelia, which is a bee plant that's used a lot as a cover crop in Europe, and buckwheat, and then a bee forage mix. And here's some pictures of the Spicelia. And here's something I want to point out. If anybody knows what that is, that insect, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, here's our buckwheat, and one of the things, we've used buckwheat for many years, uh, especially when we were growing vegetables as a great mid-season weed suppressor. And you always hear people saying, oh, you know, don't let it go to, don't let it go to flower or go to seed because of weed potential. Well, you know, our experience has been that it is about the weeniest weed you can ever hope for. And I just think that's some kind of dogma that's going on about the weed potential for buckwheat. But this year, we're, uh, this spring, we'll be collecting data on last year's overseeding, so we'll, uh, we'll be able to back up that, um, our experience with some numbers, I hope. And then our, um, this is our third treatment was the bee forage mix, and we got this from Ernst Conservation. But due to a wet spring and lots of weed pressure, you can see there's a whole who's who of weeds here, uh, we had pretty much a, a crop failure. So one of our primary goals coming out of this project is to learn how to establish these um, seeded mixes how to get better at it. The one thing on the right here, you can see that uh, sunflower, the native sunflower that did do pretty well in this, so that was it. 
All right, so here's a kind of complicated graph, but I'm just going to, yeah, I got to watch my time here, so I want to get to the important stuff too, I mean, the other stuff about what you can do. But, um, so if you look at this, uh, right here, this line here is percent bloom, because that's on this uh, right-hand axis. So that's percent bloom for the buckwheat, and then over here, this line here is the percent bloom for the phacelia. So the buckwheat is brownish and the phacelia is blue. And then uh, uh, over on this axis here, we have the average number of bees. Okay, and that was um, visual five minutes per meter squared. We had a meter set out and we just sat there for five minutes and counted them. And then um, if you look at the key on the bottom here, it tells you honeybee on phacelia, honeybee on buckwheat, bumblebee on phacelia, bumblebee on buckwheat. So the buckwheat's brown. Uh, Light, light brown and dark brown, and the bumblebees are um, the light colors. So, but anyway, I want to look at this uh, time here. See how good I'm getting with these little things. If you look at this time here, this is when both were pretty good flower, 50 cent bloom or so. And you look at it, you'll see that on the brown, this, this is honeybees on the buckwheat. So honeybees love the buckwheat, whereas down here, this is the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, here. here's the, the honeybees on the buckwheat, is the, on, the, on the phacelia is the dark blue, so they're not so much interested in the phacelia, and then the bumblebees on the phacelia is a light blue, so they're loving the phacelia, and then this light brown here, the bumblebees on the buckwheat, they're not so much like it, so there's definitely preferences, so that was interesting for us to find out. And then the other thing that was really interesting to us was, uh, that insect I showed you on the facelia was tarnished plant bug. I'm sure many of you recognize that. And um, you can see the numbers are through the roof on the facelia, which is this um, tarnished plant bug on the facelia is this red bar, and the purple on the buckwheat. And then the, the, brown, the golden bar here is actually in the bee forage mix, which ended up being almost pure gallon soga. So you can see the tarnished plant bug in the early season did really well in the facelia and um, gallon soga, but not so much on the buckwheat. So this has interesting implications, I think, in terms of, you know, maybe uh, the failure is a good trap crop for if you're growing strawberries and, or cut flowers that are blooming this time of year. But anyway, there's a lot of things to think about. Uh, <clears throat> what else can you do? Uh, maybe you want to keep honeybees. I'd say uh, yes if you are interested in um, the honey. If you are fascinated with social insects, they are a great hobby and really will keep you being a lifelong learner. We keep them, we like them for apotherapy. This is Nancy uh, in her beekeeping outfit and we both get some issues with uh, from farming from repetitive motions, you know, like tennis elbow and just, you know, tendonitis in different areas. So we do bee sting therapy, that's great. If you want to enhance the pollination on your farm and gardens, that's mainly why we have bees. I mean, the other reasons are important too, but this is the main reason. But it also can be a double-edged sword. If you load your property with honeybees, they may be going for the same resources as the native pollinators, and uh, you could be, um, you know, causing them some problems and really shooting yourself in the foot because a lot of them are better pollinators than the honeybees. And if you're going to save the bees, I don't think that's a good reason to keep honeybees because uh, you know, there are beekeepers who, who are doing that. And I don't worry so much about honeybees because they have beekeepers that are going to make sure they're always around. Okay, and the other thing I think is really important is to uh, think about the use of pesticides, you know, in society and on our individual farms. And this, this, we have this paradigm that, you know, as a society we were convinced that it's acceptable to spray toxins on our food before we eat it. So this is, this is a bad idea for us and a bad idea for the pollinators. You know, and that's easy, uh, I say avoid spraying is one thing, that's easy for me to say, and it is actually because we don't spray anything on any of our, our crops. And the way we do that is we use alternative management practices or varieties, and, uh, but we also uh, change our markets. So for example, most of our apples don't go to fresh market, they go, we, we press them into making cider. We sell hot cider at the winter market, or we turn it into vinegar, we make it hard cider and turn it into vinegar. So, you know, we're just, uh, we're pretty hardcore about not using pesticides here, and that's my soapbox. But if you do believe that you need to spray, you should definitely consider, you know, your selection of your product. 
and uh, uh, pesticides are, are rated as either highly toxic, toxic, or non-toxic to honeybees. Okay, so please pick the non-toxic ones. Uh, your timing, you want to avoid spraying things that are in flower. And uh, if a lot of times a wet spray is the worst for pollinators to pick up. So um, if you can spray at, at night or dusk, I and mean, even some labels say uh, spray at night. Not too many farmers I know are doing that, but uh, it's on the label. And then also you want to avoid drift onto uh, just onto weeds and flowering crops, um, clovers, dandelions, things like that. There's a lot of bee poisonings that happen when somebody sprays a crop and there was an understory of a flowering crop. Okay, and then uh, you know we're certified organic, so we think uh, is certified organic always pollinator friendly. Uh, it definitely tastes great, and we really want to encourage people to buy organic, locally grown. But uh, it's not always um, pollinator friendly. And we hope that you will uh, think before you spray. Just because it's OMRI listed uh, uh, as an acceptable spray for organic practices, uh, even these organically approved uh, sprays like Bovaria bassiana, that's um, a fungus that attacks insects. They, these are all broad spectrum, so they, they get everybody. The, the spinosa, the entrust, is one that is um, really being used a lot now with spotted wing drosophila on fruit, and it's uh, really have a bit of a problem with it. Uh, neem, piganic, you know, we think these are also, um, um, you know, not harmful, but they, they can be really harmful to pollinators and other beneficial insects. And uh, like I said, I got a pet peeve about entrust, so this idea of in Dow we entrust as organic farmers. You know, Dow, let's not forget, Dow are the uh, people that brought us Agent Orange. So um, I think there's a lot of things to think about before we just go for the entrust uh, box to spray. I've seen a lot of people putting it on, uh, or hearing about people putting it on fall raspberries and ever-bearing strawberries. And these are crops that are what, fruiting and in bloom at the same time. So not only they're spraying it right on the fruit right before it's harvested, but also onto the flowers that are getting visited by the pollinators. So you know what else can you do? We're still on that, and I'm going to just say habitat, habitat, habitat. Um, we really need to change the relationship with pollinator-friendly plants and start filling our uh, farms gaps with these. And I, here's a picture of um, this is. Uh, the uh, gallon soga that, as vegetable farmers, I think it's the most hated thing on most people's farms. If you say gallon soga, uh, often venomous responses come up. But uh, if you look right over here, can you see my little sun? There's a, a bumblebee, a Bombus ternarius, a tricolored bumblebee visiting the gallon soga. And um, so this is a, you know, we got to soften our eyes a little bit on these on these weeds. And the gallon soga acts like a great cover crop. It does all the things cover crops do, um, except fight weeds, because it becomes a weed. Um, we are really into the trees and shrubs for providing season-long nectar and pollen resources. They're, they're easy to install and maintain. And you can get a lot of bang for your buck. A lot of them will spread once you put in the initial population, like the wetland rose. The uh, black locust here is a great um, honey producing plant. I've seen in the literature people saying you can get 800 to 1,000 or up to 1,500 pounds of honey per acre from black locust trees. And these are, uh, they only bloom for about 10 days, but they're just cranking it out when they bloom. You'll see on our list here, like the button bush, the dogwoods, the winterberry, these are all uh, wetland loving plants. So our wet spots that are not productive for fruit for us, we're, we're and we're enhancing them by adding these plants. And the witch hazel is a really cool flower because it's so late. As we think about extending our uh, nectar and pollen season, we, um, you know, witch hazel is the last plant to flower. Sometimes these are flowering in November. So cool plants. Um, you know, there's other perennials um, that are great for um, attracting pollinators and, and giving them what they need, milkweeds, for you know not only for monarchs, but the, you can see there's a bumblebee on that milkweed right there, that um, for uh, providing nectar and pollen, and honeybees love milkweeds. 
the Helleniums, these uh, uh, sneezeweeds, the atris, the uh, agastache, and the monardas, all these are, are great to be planting around uh, on, on your farms. This is, uh, idea has been getting picked up by uh, researchers. Here's Michigan State University got this big pollinator research grant last year. It was like $1.6 million. And this is my alma mater, so I like uh, tooting their horn a little bit. And Isaac Rufus's lab in the Department of Entomology did a study looking at um, putting one acre patches of uh, wildflower mix uh, in, per 10 acres of blueberries. And they calculated the $700 establishment cost. And what they found, so down, down here, uh, in the fourth year after planting uh, the blueberry field, after planting the blueberry fields with the pollinator plant patches, had a 33% higher yield. So um, this increased yield for just that one year last year increased um, the, the their income that paid for the planting, and now they're looking to continue these benefits into the future. And then off on the right, there's a picture of. Um, what happens if you screen blueberries and they don't get properly pollinated versus uh, pollen, properly pollinated ones. So it's good to see the uh, research going on. But you know, as usual, some farmers are ahead of the research. This is a singing frog farm in Sebastopol, California. And they've been doing these patches for, for years and, and having good results. So another thing that we can do is, uh, I like this idea of softening our eyes. We've got, I, I don't know what it is, but we have this um, kind of paradox where we think a clean field, you know, straight rows and mowed lawns and all this stuff is really beautiful. But uh, I'm trying to change it myself in my own head. And uh, we're practicing scruffy horticulture where we leave, you know, things unmowed and allow the milkweed to go to bloom and allow these asters in the foreground to come to bloom. And then also, um, if you have these spaces, to so you time your mowing strategically. It doesn't always have to be mowed to look like a, a golf course. You know, wait until after the plants have flowered or after the monarchs have left the milkweeds, and then, um, then do your mowings. So another thing we, uh, we do here a lot on the farm is provide nesting and overwintering sites. These are some uh, Phragmites reeds that we stuck in a box and, uh, to see what would happen. And uh, a lot of cool things happened. I got my little sunshine here. So you see, I put that down here. Let me just move it right there. You can see there is a grass carrying wasp. And over here on the lower right, you can see a close up of what it looks like. So these wasps collect um, tree crickets and provision their nests with tree crickets and then lay their eggs on that and their young develop on that, which is cool because the tree crickets are kind of a pest in our apples. And then you can also see. Over here, well, let me try my pink thing. Hold on a second. You can see here um, a capped Phragmites cell. So this could either be a mason wasp or a mason bee, and uh, so we're we're enjoying having them. There's you know a few of those around, and uh, even the ones that don't show anything can be half full. So this is an easy way to provide nesting site. If you think that that's an over uh, a limiting factor for your population which I think is one of the main things that are keeping our populations down, this is a great way to uh, build up the populations. Here's uh, my buddy, the blue orchard mason bee. And uh, we do these nest boxes here, this yellow one. We drill these specifically for this blue orchard mason bee. You'll remember I said this is like a, this lady, these ladies are a workhorse in early season pollination. And these uh, boxes you make have uh, 5 16th inch holes. We want them at least six inches deep. And uh, you want to be able to clean them out because um, you can build up mites and other problems if you just leave them over the air. They become kind of like a cemetery for the, for the bees. So we, we put uh, straws that we insert in there and we can, we can pull those out. And uh, this is a style of uh, a mason bee box that is. Um, it's like two pieces of wood that have been routed, and then you can take apart. So it makes a circle when they're together. This is cool for being able to look at it. So these are actually um, some grass-carrying wasps. You can see the, the grass, the grass stuffed in here, right there. And um, 
This one here is a shared one. These are the grass carrying wasps here. And then these are the mason bees here. You can see the mud walls. I have too much fun with these markers. You can see the little mud walls here. This one above is mason bees also. So they take their um, bee bread, their wad of pollen and nectar, and then they lay their egg in it, and then the lar the larva hatches and eats that pollen and then pupates. And then they overwinter as pupae like this, and then they emerge in the spring. So it's fascinating insect. One of the other things we're doing is we borrowed this idea from uh, permaculture. Sepp Holzer, who's an Austrian permaculturalist, has a term he calls hugelkultur, which means mound culture. And uh, we take, um, the idea is to take wood and you know, logs, and we have a lot of prunings from our farm, so we do a lot with prunings. And you build a mound and then cover it with soil. So you know, here's, the, here's the wood, and then you fill it with soil, and then plant stuff on top. And then after a few years, it, it, it breaks down, gets more dense. But the wood is always there uh, for moisture holding so it's, uh, and slow-release fertility over time. So we've, we've put a little twist on that. We call it bumble culture. And uh, you can see here we're using a lot of our prunings. And then um, this is a little demonstration garden we have by our farm stand. And this one we planted to uh, buckwheat. And what this does is it provides nesting habitat, but also overwintering habitat. The, uh, the new queens from the bumblebee hives come out in the fall and they get mated and then they're looking for a place to spend the winter. So any nooks and crannies where they can be protected from the weather a little or from predators is going to be beneficial to them. Uh, we're also working with the um, University of Nebraska down here uh, looking at bumblebee um, nest boxes. So we're going to, I, I have, they sent me a prototype and I'm going to build a few more. And we're filling these with different materials and putting them in different locations to see if we can get bumblebees to nest. It's been kind of like the holy grail in, in terms of um, being able to build up bumblebee populations. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence that nesting is a limiting factor. They'll find dead queens inside where queens have had a fight over a nest box and only one survived. So um, people think that providing uh, nesting habitat is really going to help the bumblebee population. And you know, anecdotally, we're seeing a lot of bumblebees around here now. So I don't have any hard data to prove anything with it. But uh, I think our efforts are paying off. So, But I'm really looking forward to putting out these boxes in different places and seeing how they do. So and here's uh, another uh, idea for bumble culture. This is our more of our redneck bumble culture out back. So we piled all, you know, there's prunings in here, and then we had to tear off a rotten sill off our barn, and we piled it up here. And this is great habitat also. I probably will eventually cover this with uh, some soil or compost of manure and then have it as a platform to, to plant in. But anything I can do, this again, this is scruffy looking stuff, but uh, it's what the pollinators need. And let's not forget about the ground nesters. These are most of our um, native pollinating bees, the solitary nesting bees, are ground nesters. So um, this one's a little tricky, too. We've been uh, making mounds of sand, south-facing mounds of sand on our farm and trying to get the uh, bees to nest in there, but I haven't had any success. We do have a few places where they nest naturally, like in our driveway. It's a little sandy driveway. And uh, up on our neighbor's logging road, where there's a lot of holes dug. But uh, I haven't really been able to create anything yet. It's only been a couple of years that I've been doing it. And uh, you know, one of the challenges is that when you make a pile like that, then the weeds start growing in it. So to keep it bare is a, you know, we have to go through and hand weed it. But uh, another thing you can do is um, to limit tillage. So if you can do no-till, we do all our plantings no-till now. And um, we also, uh, recommend that people limit tillage. So remember we were talking about those squash bees in your um, cucurbits that you know maybe you don't need to cover every square inch with your uh, tines. So I have some uh, of my favorite resources here listed. There's some great websites that you know I always say talk about Xerces, amazing organization. You should check them out if you want to learn more. Any of these websites are, are fun to, to look at. And then there's some great books. And you can see a lot of these are fairly new. This is really a topic that's gaining momentum. Um, but here's a nice list for you to look through. And uh, maybe when you have more time next winter, you can 
get this on your reading list. So that's uh, all I have for now. It looks like I was able to save a few minutes if anybody had any questions. John, thanks so much. What an informative um, webinar here. Um, and I appreciate all of your analogies and ways of explaining things. Um, so uh, this presentation, just so everyone knows, is being recorded. It will be posted on our website within a week. And we'll also post a PDF of it so you can um, get a uh, look at these um, resources more closely. Um, and uh, one question that came up earlier on, um, uh, Helen Wybrow asked whether there were specific um, uh, pollinator plants you could plant um, that would encourage uh, pollinators to come to when blueberries are in bloom. Um, uh, okay, so my thought on that is, and I don't know what, hi Helen, I don't know what uh, the question was whether you're uh, worried about them attracting um, the, the bumblebees away from the blueberries, which I think would be the concern. Uh, one of the things about the bumblebees and, and honeybees is they have this uh, thing called flower constancy where they'll pick a flower that they're visiting and they'll stick with it. So they're not going to like go from dandelions and then, oh, look at the blueberry over there and jump to the blueberry and then go back to the dandelion. So you want to encourage them to just go to your blueberries and not see anything else. So if, uh, you know, you don't, that, that would be the opposite of what you would want is something attracting at the same time. So you want to keep your uh, dandelions and other stuff mode, you know, within your rows at, at that time. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. So it sounds like in, you, if you are like growing fruit crops or whatever you're hoping, you know, to be uh, pollinated for your commercial production, you actually don't want other things um, blooming at the same time. Um, is that right? So that they'll go to your crops versus those um, other uh, food plants? Right, exactly. So that, that's exactly what I'm trying to say. And you would want, um, but you do want to have nectar and floral resources throughout the whole season. So that's why we did that one chart where we looked at the overlapping of flowering times of the different plants that we have on the farm so we could kind of analyze that. So, yeah, you don't want anything blooming exactly at the same time, but you want stuff that's going to be blooming at a different time to nourish those pollinators throughout the rest of the season so that their population comes big and strong next blueberry season. Great. And there's another question here, um, whether you've had any, uh, done any experimenting with basswood and tulip poplar in Vermont? Um, yeah, basswood is a, a fantastic uh, bee forage tree. Um, it doesn't bloom here every year on, a, on our farm, but when it does, it's just totally abuzz with, um, with, with bees. So we're, we're, we're planting more. We're also planting some uh, little leaf linden, which is in the same family. It's a, it's a basswood tree. And um, tulip, poplar, tulip poplar, I have one tree <laughs> that I'm planting. I think it, we're just right here in northern Vermont, we're right on the edge of its zone. We don't see them um, out in natural systems here. But um, I'm hoping it can survive. But yeah, it's another great, um, another great bee forage tree. And maybe I see your uh, it's Tina in Harland. They might grow well there. Um, and then one other question I had: you were just mentioning about um, you know pulling the straws, your Phragmite uh, habitat that you created, you know, and cleaning the boxes. When when do you do that sort of thing so that you don't? you know, disturb the pollinators when they actually need that? Is that something you do at the end of the season um, when they've gone to hibernate somewhere else? Or uh, what's the timing on that? Yeah, we would, we would, we would, uh, what we want to do is protect the straws from, there's all these little parasitic wasps and things that want to uh, parasitize the larvae too. And um, so we want to protect them from them. So what we do is take the nest box down and screen it. But we don't want to pull the straws out because if you pull it when the larvae are young, they can fall off of that ball of pollen and nectar and then not find it again very easily. So we wait until the uh, fall when they've uh, pupated it or pre pupate before we pull the straws and really jostle things. Great. Any other lingering questions? I think we covered a lot um, here. And um, oh, where do you get your plant stock? That's a great question. Um, 
and do you have any specific nurseries that you like? Yeah, well, um, the, my favorite organic nursery is the Farm Between, so <laughs> we propagate a lot of our own stock like that. But uh, some great places to look are these, um, for if you want to plant a bunch of trees and pollinator friendly conservation plants, are the state conservation nurseries. Uh, New Hampshire has one, New York State has one, and you can get on and you can order stuff, uh, you know, in big batches and, and the prices are very reasonable. But I also want to say if anybody wants to, um, you know, email me if they have some specific questions, I'm happy to uh, take some emails and, and get back to you when I can. Great. Um, well, thanks everyone very much for joining us. John, thank you very much for um, being with us and sharing all this information. And, and just again, um, I'm going to put uh, our uh, survey in here. I hope that you fill it out. There's a place to put your email in the survey as well if you want follow-up information. Um, also, you'll find all of it on our website um, in about a week. So you can just come back and visit us. Uh, and have a great afternoon. And um, thanks again, John. Okay. Thank you. That was fun. Bye, all.